Over to the next uh, facilitator, Prof. Uh, Takalani Mashal. Hey, thank you very much, Ken. Good afternoon. This presentation has got four presentations. I mean, this session has got three or four presentations. The first presentation will be by Mr. Mashovi, Chief Mavizela, who is from the Department of Higher Education and Tri Training. His bio is as follows. Matlovi Chief Mavizela is the Chief Director responsible for higher education policy in the Department of Higher Education Training, South Africa. His main responsibilities include the development and implementation of higher education policies, measurement and analysis of research outputs from universities, research for police support, and the regulation and administration of private higher education institutions. As such, he has been involved in the authorship and implementation of several policies in the higher education system of South Africa including the research output policy of 2003 and revised in 2017, regulations of private higher education institutions of 2016, the policy framework on internationalization of higher education in South Africa, 2020, the revised language policy framework of 2020. He has been the principal author of the analysis and reports of the higher education research outputs since 2007. Over to you, Mr. Matlubi. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for that very long uh, introduction. Uh, I am just about to go through uh, load shedding here, and I really hope my um, connectivity will hold. And also, I will I will uh, switch off my video, but I just wanted to show my face. Uh, so that you know who's talking and uh, that is not a robot. Um, and thank you for this invitation uh, to the colleagues at ASAF and the uh, National Scholarly Editors Forum. Just want to get this on the presentation mode. Uh, we given, <clears throat> I think it's something like uh, 15 minutes of uh, presentation. Uh, so it's it's not that much uh, time one has. So I will hit uh, the ground running. And I'm actually uh, happy that this presentation comes after uh, Sean's uh, presentation, uh, even though that one is on scholarly uh, uh, publications. Um, this presentation is on uh, accreditation of creative outputs. Um, <clears throat> but as you may have heard in the introduction, um, I am also responsible for the publications um, in, in the department. And incidentally, I also uh, uh, emphasize some words here <clears throat> which relate to uh, what uh, Sean had, uh, has uh, presented in the previous presentation, but We'll get to that um, at a later stage. So uh, my presentation is mainly on, on the policy. And uh, as we are uh, implementing it, that came into place in 2017, as you can see in its title. And we started to implement it in 2019. And we are therefore in the third year of uh, uh, its implementation, and we, we've produced uh, two reports, uh, first one during COVID and the second one also during uh, COVID lockdown, basically, I guess, uh, COVID now these days also means um, uh, lockdown. Um, and, and we just had a, a workshop for the first time, a national workshop for the first time on the policy last week on Thursday. And we, although we had been planning to have the workshop, but in terms of its um, timing, we also thought we have it uh, before this uh, presentation because the audiences are different. And also some of the issues um, that uh, we, we wanted to deal with at the workshop, we didn't want them to be, to spill over uh, this, this meeting. 
So the creative outputs uh, that are recognized by the policy um, are those, the fine arts and visual arts, music, theater, performance and dance, design, film and television, literary arts, and on innovations, is the policy uh, recognizes patents and plant breeders' rights. So those are the areas that we are dealing with. And part of our um, intention, uh, because we working on us uh, improving the policy, is to also look at the areas that are not covered. Now, back on the on those uh, concepts that I have um, emphasized uh, in in those two uh, first bullets. First of all, that we are viewing uh, the creative outputs, and not only just uh, a matter of view, but also in terms of the funding uh, of the creative outputs at the universities. The funding comes from um, the research outputs uh, pot or research output fund. Um, so it's viewed as research, as well as the units uh, that we are um, uh, allocating to the institutions uh, or to the creative outputs are the same units uh, that uh, um, or the value of the unit is the same as that of the publications. So in a nutshell, uh, this is subsidy and it's subsidy to the institutions. It's not at all, um, uh, even though the institutions and academics, uh, to some extent, uh, conflate uh, this matter with um, incentives. <laughs> and and uh, Prof. Rivas, um, I will not define that word, um, but uh, that's how it's being used by the institu institutions to incentivize uh, the individuals and to some extent and a conflation and this is probably where you will um, want that definition um, of incentives but a conflation of what is an incentive vis-a-vis -vis an inducement and the universities are basically using this as inducements. Uh, so you induce to produce more research, more um, outputs and so that the institution can uh, have a good standing and whatever that good standing is at, at whatever cost, but uh, one of the things are these days, the, the rankings, uh, international rankings of universities and really um, causing a mess really to higher education. Uh, and that mess, uh, you know, is on scholarship, is on quality, um, it, the ranking itself, um that you are ranked better than the other one and that other one next door or even internationally well that's that's the point and i guess as i was saying earlier on um, i was glad i'm glad that you know this presentation comes after that and that was the reason uh comes after that of uh, sean and that is the reason i had actually emphasized um, uh, those words uh, that uh, to policy and to the Department of Higher Education um, and training, this is research and this is a subsidy. But of course, there is still also a debate uh, within the uh, scholars and the, the, the academics that are assisting us with the implementation of this policy. And I will talk about that uh, at a later stage. And then the last bullet there on the on the slide, uh, the department works with the with NIMPO, NIPMO uh, to evaluate submissions on innovations. So the the focus of the policy or uh, the main focus, let me say, um, and of that of evaluation is on originality, whether the output contributes to fresh understanding and or stylistic, uh, thematic, or conceptual innovation in the discipline, the relevance whether the work demonstrates an intellectually and creatively informed response to the subject, and the newness uh, should be understood to indicate a given work that has never been accredited for subsidy before. So those are the, the, the three core criteria uh, that is used to evaluate um, uh, the, the, the creative outputs from the institutions. And again, 
this is as much as uh, the intention is to um, uh, promote scholarship and scholarship in this area of creative or artistic outputs, but uh, it's also used in this case as evaluation for relevance for um, uh, subsidy allocation to the institutions. So it's two pronged and probably it may not be um, uh, all uh, encompassing of what needs to be evaluated on um, scholarship production in this area of work on artistic outputs, uh, but that is what we are going with at the moment until such time that that is pointed out and the academics make additions or even uh, edit what we are having while, when we review um, the policy, which is another plan that I will talk about in my last slide. So the DHET evaluation process will be final and there will be no uh, recourse for appeals. This is what we are saying in the policy. And the reason being that we uh, cover the past three years. So that, that is N minus three, N being the current year, and then going back uh, the three years of the output, uh, especially the output that has been in the public. So in 2022, it would be anything that, that was uh, in the public in, in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And then each output must be accompanied by annotation or written commentary by the artist or uh, to contextualize or elucidate the work. And such contextualization would require it to be about between uh, 500 and 700 words uh, or be seen as a, uh, and, and, and though that, that annotation should not be seen as a replacement of the output, but uh, it provides information or the background um, that may not be ascertained uh, from examination of the creative outputs. And basically, what we are saying is that, and that's the last bullet, the annotation must articulate concepts and seek to uh, make tacit information or knowledge clear because, because it is art and, and artists, um, and, and even if you like, uh, academics who are artists would argue that um, uh, a creative output should speak for itself uh, without uh, any annotation. But in this case, because it is not just a, a, a form of appreciation of uh, artistic uh, output, but it's meant to then uh, uh, provide subsidy to the institution along those uh, criteria that are in the first bullet. And therefore that is the reason therefore that we require that uh, elaboration or annotation. We've had debates again on this one with the academics that are assisting us and, and um, those who are for and against you know, the, the annotation. But that's exactly what then the, the policy uh, says and, and what we require uh, for the policy. And, and therefore, you know, for the allocation of such. Each creative output is required to be peer reviewed uh, before submitting to the DHET and institutions must choose peer reviewers who have appropriate academic qualifications and so on. And the policy provides a general procedure for submission, which is further elaborated in the implementation guide, the guidelines. And I think the next presentation is going to dwell more on the process of, uh, of uh, or the submission process. The implementation guidelines are mainly used uh, by the creative output. We, we also develop the, the, the implementation guidelines uh, together with the members of the panel. Uh, and that's the, the title of the panel, Creative Outputs Evaluation Panel, which assists uh, uh, us in evaluation of the creative outputs, as well as on some of the policy matters uh, or implementation of the policy. But then, that implementation guideline uh, is made available to peer reviewers um, uh, so that the reviewers uh, are able to produce uh, the reviews that are of quality, but also with a synergy um, uh, 
because they work uh, they work on the implementation guidelines together with their reviewers template uh, to create the consistency Chief. across. Chief, you are left with two minutes to wrap up your presentation. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, so in the past three years, I think I, it's just this slide and the next one uh, will be the last one. Uh, so in the past three years uh, of implementation, there are some changes that we have made more on the side of the improvements. Um, and what we are also observing is that um, we have a problem with the, with the pool of uh, peer reviewers in the country. And it's something that we are working with the sector on and uh, to see how we can improve and to see what, what uh, we can do uh, to alleviate that problem. And um, we are very, having a very topical issue um, uh, on the conflict of interest. Um, and I think some of the issues were raised also on the publication side and some of the issues even by earlier presentations, uh, earlier today uh, presentations uh, around the, the publishing. And, and so here too, uh, the issue of conflict of interest from at institutional level uh, up to national level uh, where we are involved as the department. And again, that's another issue that we are picking, we have picked up in during the implementation and it's an issue that we therefore are addressing. And that uh, there's increasing number of inter interdisciplinary submissions that do not fit neatly into the established subfields that are presented in the, in the first slide. Of course, the issue of ethics, I decided to put this one just like that, uh, ethics, and uh, so that you can interpret it as well uh, in the manner that you, you would think that what is ethical, what is unethical when it comes here. And of course, we can provide some of the details uh, when we have discussions. And then concept of practice-led research and its implication on how the policy is understood and interpreted by university. This is the topic we want to take up uh, next year. We've already set up uh, a period by we when we want to have a national discussion on it, a, a webinar, uh, but we just need to come with the details on it. And it's part of the issues that um, are topical uh, that I mentioned earlier on among the panel members and academics on whether this uh, area of work of uh, artistic outputs, are, are they really, uh, should they be regarded as being research led or is it just an area of uh, uh, creative outputs from the institutions? And then we uh, also okay. planning to start a process <laughs> of uh, improvement of policy from the next financial year. That is the last point, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Wabizela. The next presenter is Dr. Nev Smith from this University. Renee Alicia Smith has the School of Arts at the University of the Witwatersrand. She is the immediate past president of the South African Humanities Dean's Association and was executive dean of DUT's Faculty of Arts and Design an alumna of UKZ and Falmouth College of Arts, now Falmouth University in UK. Smith co-founded the Arts and Design Digital Festival and was festival director from 2013 to 2020. She continues to collaborate with the media art research group promoting transdisciplinary global South collaboration with artists and scholars from Lab Inter in Brazil. Rene has extensive governance and leadership experience, having worked for, led, and or served on a wide range of organizations over the past two decades, including state bodies like the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as nonprofits like the African Art Center and Art for Humanity. Amongst others, she served as chairperson of Agenda Feminist Media and is serving a second term as a steering committee chairperson of the South African Center for Digital Language language resources. One of DSI's South African research infrastructure and roadmap projects. She has taught at several institutions of higher education in South Africa and before turning to academia, consulted across sectors, including our projects in other subject countries. Over to you, Renee. 
Thanks so much uh, for the introduction. I just need to check if I, check if I need to share the screen myself. You're welcome to share your, yourself, Renee. Okay. Okay, um, just a good afternoon, everyone. I hope it's clear on your side. If you can just put it on full slide, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to present on the evaluation process with respect to creative outputs. Um, So I, I really wanted to, and, and thank you also to Mr. Mabizela for his uh, comments. I think you'll find that I'll touch up some of what he has reflected on as well as what Prof. Faber will be talking to. But I did want to sort of share the journey uh, with regards to the recognition of peer-reviewed creative outputs. So there had obviously been a team that had worked on uh, the project prior to 2013. And in 2013, a working group report on creative outputs was presented. This group essentially advised DIET on amongst others, appropriate peer review systems, allocation of units and processes, procedures for submission and evaluation of creative outputs. So around this time when I began, uh, became involved with the process of the uh, recognition of creative outputs while I was on the South African Humanities Dean's Association. Throughout this time, DIET has worked closely with NIPMO, who Mr. Mabizela has spoken about, and between 2014 and 2016, there was wide sector consultation around the policy development process. In 2017 is when we finally have our policy gazetted, which is the policy on the evaluation of creative outputs and innovations okay. produced by South African public higher education institutions. And again, there was a round of national workshops in 2018, creative outputs workshops, and many of us attended or supported colleagues to attend. And this was important because it was really at this point where we, we, where we imagined the implementation would begin, but there was a sense certainly from DHEAD that actually we needed these implementation guidelines. So the first iteration of the guidelines, the 2019 guidelines, really provided the, the guidance um, around creative outputs, but also obviously patents and registered plant breeders' rights. I note that the first cycle, um, the Creative Research Output Report, which is publicly available, the 2020 report, um, this was in relation to the 2019 submissions. The first cycle, which, um, as was mentioned earlier, was N minus three. There was a subsequent report in 2021 with the deadline of November 2020. And um, we also think what is really important is the 2019 implementation guidelines were revised. And this I think is quite significant. So the, that should actually say 2021 and not 2001 implementation guidelines, those were revised in October, 2021. And we've just been through another round of evaluations with the deadline of November, 2021. And we had a meeting earlier this year and Mr. Mabizela spoke to that being the uh, report that's pending. I've shared this just to demonstrate that these are all publicly available through the DHEAD uh, website. Um, but I want to touch on a couple of the policy provisions. And of course, the first is in relation to the, uh, the recognition and reward of quality creative outputs. And again, I think in the earlier presentation, there was reference to the significance of finally allocating subsidy for this. Um, the policy obviously covers innovations, but for today's discussions, we're particularly interested in the creative output subfields, which as you know, are fine and visual arts, music, theater, performance, and dance, design, film and television, and literary arts. But there are two other provisions in the policy that I think are worth reflecting on and certainly uh, discussing today, or at least 
uh, uh, highlighting today. And the first is the clause 10, that the policy acknowledges that there are other legitimate and worthwhile research practices, which may not be covered in the, in the aforementioned categories, uh, and, and that don't fall neatly within these parameters. And you heard earlier reference to the interdisciplinary submissions. So these are often, uh, you know, they're also uh, practices that fall within the realms of research undertaken in fields such as journalism, translation, scholarly editing. So this is already in the, in, in the 2017 policy. Plus 11 is equally instructive. It says it should be noted that the department's subsidy is aimed at universities and not individual scholars or academics. And only work that's germane to one of the core functions of the institution will be considered. And I think those are both really significant when we get to the end, I'll talk a bit about some of the feedback. Now, there are two processes, and I've, I've, I've tried to outline these as a kind of internal uh, review process and external. By internal, I mean the university review processes, and these are really, really essential. Um, the first is an application which is made. There's a creative output review process where internal committees, this is within universities, will screen and verify for policy compliance prior to submitting to DHET. These, what are then called the approved institutional submissions, it's the institutional research offices that consolidate, consolidate for submission to DHET for evaluation and the allocation of subsidy. They're often accompanied by a letter of declaration signed by the DVC or an, or an official rep, and the letter will clarify the internal evaluation committee members. These internal submissions are then uploaded to Ross. And they must include two peer review reports from experts in the discipline or subfield. And so there's a rigorous process that's provided for internally. And I'm going to now refer to the external process in the sense that the universities through so their systems have a peer evaluation by university selected expert reviewers. The reviewer templates have become increasingly important, and I think this is significant because this is about standardizing. And thirdly, the creative output submissions that are made must have been recommended by reviewers. So you'll see on the external side, there's this internal, very kind of rigorous process. Then there's the external uh, contribution in the form of the um, expert reviewers that the university oversees that process. But then there's also the sub-panel review process, which is overseen by DHET. And before turning to that, I just wanted to reflect that in the policy, and I've provided some link links for ease of reference, there's specific reference to the steps, the different steps with regards to the evaluation process. But back to our subfield panels. So there are two DHET panels that are, that are important, and the first is a subfield panel. Here, DHET will allocate submissions to subfield panel members for review, and these are really the discipline, field, subject, practice uh, experts. They will essentially uh, review all of the information that's been submitted via ROS, including the review reports. They'll present submissions qualifying for subsidy and determination of unit allocation. And according to the terms of reference, it's the subpanels um, sub who assess the creative works and determine if they embody original research production by practitioners or scholars across the breadth of the creative output disciplines. They are also the ones who conduct the evaluation of the creative output submissions with adherence to, and this is the requirement, the highest quality standards of evaluation of creative and innovation outputs and consistent with the rigor expected of academics and professional practices in the respected fields. They are also required to recommend the outcomes of the evaluations to the advisory panel and make recommendations on the implementation of the policy. We also have the advisory panel and normally the advisory panel members are the chairs of the sub panels. They are responsible for advising DIET on the processes and procedures for the efficient assessment of creative research outputs in line with the policy to advise DIET on policy improvements 
as I mentioned, chairing these subpanel, subfield panel meetings, but also in terms of the terms of reference to contribute towards continuously improving the criteria and guidelines for the subpanels to advise on the efficient ways of implementing the policy and on improving the process of evaluation, including the online system, and then, of course, to recommend necessary improvements. So as I close, it's really important to note that feedback is essential to this process. At the beginning of every annual meeting, we have a plenary presentation, a discussion, and information sharing. And it's really critical that uh, panel members attend this, especially because academics often might have been on sabbatical or otherwise would have missed a session in the preceding year. And this is where we get to bring to the plenary, to the meeting, the full meeting, what were some of the deliberations from the previous year, what are the areas that we are suggesting DIET needs to look into, and, and what, the way in which we ought to conduct ourselves during the session. The panels provide feedback essentially to DHIT after the meetings as well. So after the review meetings, each subfield panel will meet. They'll have a discussion around what were some of the areas that they've identified, and they will share that with DHIT through the advisory panel. Some of the persistent issues that come up each year over the past three years were one, the annotations from the outset, there were real questions around the quality of the annotations. And over the past three years, there's been a concerted effort to provide more guidance and to improve the guidelines so that colleagues are aware of what is required in the annotation. The other area, as Mr. Mabizela mentioned, was the peer review process, consistent challenges over the past three years around just the pool. And I think we'll hear more about this when we hear from Prof. Ava. Curatorial practice from the outset was flagged in an area we need to look at, but we must be mindful that this is clearly stated in the policy. So if the policy precludes it, the implementation cannot go against that. And so what we are all looking forward to is the policy review process, which has been referred to earlier. Retrospectives have also come to the fore as areas we need to pay closer attention to. Do you acknowledge and reward uh, for individual parts or for the entire retrospective. Lots of interesting discussions around this. Confidentiality, a big issue. From the very first year, you know, we had to remind colleagues with regards to confidentiality and conflict of interest, and in particular, that all panel members represent the sector. So when we serve in these portfolios, we are representing the sector and not our respective institutions. So it is very difficult. It's a small pool we know, but we really encourage colleagues that we must observe issues around confidentiality and conflict of interest. The, we also provide uh, feedback to DIET on DHIT's processes, as well as the ROS system. So every year there have been tweaks to the NRF, uh, and NRF has been really very helpful in this regard to tweaking the ROS system. So they take on board some of our feedback. But there have also been a number of um, comments and suggestions made around university and research office participation and processes. So during these May meetings, you, you have two minutes to run out. Sure. Okay. So during these uh, meetings, there's discussion around ways in which our individual and respective universities can approve, can improve on internal systems and structures in support of the creative outputs. I've already mentioned, and really it is worth reiterating, that for many of us, we, we are needing to remind colleagues that, and, and ourselves, that really we're here in support of the sector, not our respective institutions. When we are deliberating matters, it's really about the creative outputs, not so much about individuals and individual gain. Uh, we are all looking forward to the policy review process. We know that generally, we all know policy processes take time, um, roughly around five years. And I'm very pleased that we now have a date that's been shared by D at the 2023-2024. And the meeting, the workshop that took place last week is really to begin that process of engagement. So we're very thankful for that as well. But I did want to also reiterate that the implementation guidelines have been updated since the first 
first cycle. And there's a sense that a number of people were still relying on the 2019 ones when in fact we have the newer ones. And I really do encourage colleagues to, you know, to, to, to help us uh, ensure that the current implementation guidelines are used. And lastly, really just to thank you again for this opportunity to engage with you, to say that certainly from the advisory panel and all of us that have been involved, for the, over the past decade, it really is, since implementation, a relatively new process. We are always open to improving and to, and to strengthening our system. So we really do welcome feedback. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. I have included in the slide, which will be shared, Dr. Makakule's details. She is really the, the uh, from an operations point of view, our main contact. And I'm sure you'll, she'll be able to field any further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Remy. The next speaker is Prof. Leora Faba Blackbeck from University of Johannesburg. Yoro Faba is a Johannesburg based artist, academic, writer, creator, and editor with an extensive exhibition and a publications history. She graduated with a BA Fine Art with the University of the Witwatersrand in 1985, MA Fine Art, Cum Laude, University of Witwatersrand in 1992, and DPhil Visual Art Creative Production, University of Pretoria in 2013. She's an associate professor in the Faculty of Art, Design, and Architecture. University of Johannesburg and Director of the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the faculty. In her current creative practices, she works at the interface between art and science, engaging critically, theoretically, effectively, and poetically with creative biotechnological research. The fusion of the sciences and visual art. Faber's work has been exhibited in all of South Africa's major public museums. She has presented solo exhibitions in Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Perth, and has participated in group shows in London, New York, Taipei, Latvia, and Atlanta. Over to you, Laura. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mr. Michel. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen um, and might just need a bit of um, sorry, excuse me. I'm just looking for right. Okay, is that correct? Can people see my screen? Yes, 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 we can see. Okay, it. that's great. Okay, well, I feel that my um, presentation today is going to be. Uh, simply a reiteration of a lot of what Chief Mabizela and uh, Prof Smith have already said. Um, so I will keep it quite short. Um, and I suppose what can be deduced from this is that there are certain points that are really um, essential and have been highlighted again and again and they come up in different in different contexts, in different ways. And these are the ones that perhaps we need to focus on moving forward. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank the organizers of the NSEF annual meeting for this opportunity to present on the sector's experiences of the creative outputs evaluation process. Um, I feel fairly well placed to speak on the process because I was part of the initial uh, DHET panels where the implementation guidelines were drawn up. And I have been a member of the visual arts sub panel for the past three years. So I actually am speaking partially as a member of the sector, but also um, as a member of the visual arts sub panel. So there's, you know, kind of wearing two hats here. I've been closely involved with the submission of creative outputs at UJ, as I sit on the art design and architecture faculty research committee, um, who screen all the applications and also screen all the peer reviews and have presented workshops on the submission process to colleagues in the UJ faculty art 
Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture and in the Humanities. I mentor colleagues on the submission process and also assist the UJ Research Office when required. And while I speak primarily from my experiences at UJ, I have also consulted colleagues in other institutions on their experience of the process and try to include their feedback um, in this presentation, as well as the discussions that were, or points from the discussions that were held at the National Workshop on Creative Research Outputs um, on the 16th of November, 2022, in other words, last week. Uh, I know that I have very little time uh, to do this presentation. I think I have 10 minutes. So I've tried to um, narrow the focus down to four main points of attention. I've listed these under teething problems. Um, they're things we've, I think, had to grapple with over the last three years and still really haven't quite come to terms with. Um, applicants do struggle to understand what is meant, you know, um, in the definition of the overarching criteria and guidelines for un unit allocation. So in other words, uh, applicants read the overarching criteria, they read the guidelines, and there are almost always questions pertaining to, well, what does that mean? And um, it's difficult to explain, I can only actually speak from a visual arts perspective, that these, it's impossible to pin down um, fixed hard guidelines um, when it comes to visual art, because each work needs to really be um, looked at on its own merit. So I think people do get confused. They think that the guidelines are a kind of tick box and um, don't see them really as guidelines, but rather as rules or, or um, policies that, you know, or criteria that they have to um, adhere to. Some have difficulty in understanding what is required in the annotation. And this is an ongoing um, difficulty, actually. Uh, we get various kinds of information in the annotation, some of it often very descriptive, and people don't quite seem to understand what is meant by the need to articulate the conceptual and scholarly framework in which the work should be heard or viewed. And the second point, how to just demonstrate the contribution the work makes to new knowledge. These are difficult, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, for, for me, I don't, I think they're quite, clear, quite clearly um, stated in the DOE in, um, application form, but for some reason, colleagues seem to struggle with understanding how to locate their work within a conceptual and scholarly framework and what the contribution to new knowledge um, might be. This, another point is that the drop down boxes in the application form can be confusing as not all the creative output types and subtypes align. So for instance, under the graphic outputs type, the subtypes, the subtypes are design disciplines, which are listed as discrete entities, for example, fashion design, graphic design. But then under fine art, the subtypes are related to media, such as drawing, painting, sculpture, video art, or techniques like collage, or, and, and forms of presentation, performance, installation, and artist books. So it becomes very difficult um, to, there, there's no consistency, is what I'm saying here, between the uh, types in each category, in, in, in each field and the subtypes. And this leads to some confusion, as was mentioned earlier, particularly with regard to interdisciplinary submissions uh, that do not fit neatly into established types and subtypes. And an example might be a submission can fit into two or three different output types and subtypes, 
For example, the applicant may be the director, the scriptwriter, and the performer. Under the television and the theater performance dance types and subtypes. So technically, this person could apply three times for each of these roles, but it would mean that they are applying for different roles in the same work. Um, and it becomes very difficult for the, for the applicant to decide <laughs> where they're going to place themselves um, because of these um, rather rigid kinds of criteria under each, not criteria, uh, descriptions under each output type and subtype. Um, in many projects where the type and subtype overlap, these elements are very closely interlinked. One thing that does seem to be not only at UJ, but you know, ar around the sector, that faculty research committees and research offices are still coming to terms with the best way of handling the submissions and the peer review processes and how to structure timelines accordingly. Um, and I just wanted to note that several colleagues have noted that Alistair White and Ida Makukule um, have been particularly supportive um, to research officers in this regard and have always offered prompt and valuable guidance. The second area, um, which has been, <laughs> I think, brought up in almost every presentation on the creative outputs process is the peer review process. It's, this is an area of major concern. There are numerous difficulties, which I'm just going to read through. Uh, reviewers, one in, you know, the, the institution, the research office invites a reviewer to um, peer review an output. They do not respond to these invitations or they are just simply not willing to review applications. Many ask if there's remuneration for writing the report and if told that there's not, they reject the invitation. Reviewers commit to doing the report and then we get a cancellation or the person stepping down for whatever reason at the very last minute. And that means that we can't find another reviewer in time to meet the deadline for submission. Some, do simp some agree to write the report and then just simply do not deliver uh, despite multiple reminders or others do not deliver the report on time. Some write reports that are thin, very general, and are not critical or rigorous. Uh, others write about the individual's work in general. So, you know, you might get a, you know, a sort of, um, just not a description, but an overall view of that artist's work without actually referring to the actual work being submitted for accreditation. A common problem seems to be that reviewers do not read or familiarize themselves with or focus on the DOE requirements for evaluation as they are laid out in the implementation guidelines. Similarly, many do not answer the question posed in the template or tend to respond with one word answers like yes or no. And some simply just don't take the process seriously. Um, the list continues. Uh, another problem is finding suitable reviewers. Now, the applicants are given the option to nominate, uh, I think it's two reviewers or three reviewers, uh, put down names. And this is a kind of double-edged sword because very often it's very, very uh, clear to people in the fee, in the um, artistic arena, that applicants are nominating friends or associates that they know will write favorably on their work. But on the other hand, it could be argued that these are the very people that would have an excellent insight into the applicant's work. So this is a bit of a, a conundrum. Okay. Many reviewers working in industry do not understand the concept of research in relation to practice. There is a tendency to overlook the conceptual depth or theoretical framing of the work 
in favor of technical expertise. However, not drawing on industry-related reviewers reduces the pool of people um, that we can draw on. This lack of understanding regarding why a creative work qualifies as research or not is not limited to those in the industry. Um, I think as has already been pointed out in this session, some reviewers from institution tend to disregard the DHET stated position that in order to qualify as su a subsidizable research output, the work must convincingly assert artistic practice as research. And I think the DOE is very clear about that. They are saying, you know, this is not just um, work that is there to be enjoyed or um, yeah, to provide pleasure, but how does it constitute research that is actually worthy of subsidization? And I think the DOE's policy is very clear here um, that there needs to be a clear research idea, concern, thematic, or intention. And this needs to be articulated. Liara, and be, you, yeah. Liara, you, you have yeah, two minutes to wind up. Yes, thank you. Am I, am I over time already? No, no, you are left with two minutes. Two minutes. Go okay, yes. I'm going to run then. I'm going to run and I will I can make my presentation um, available to people afterwards. Very few people that are qualified or willing to review the creative outputs. There's a tendency to draw only on local reviewers. Uh, often the same people are approached by many institutions and cannot take on the workload. Or certain reviewers do the majority of the reviews leading to the privilege of one person's opinions. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, suggestions to address these issues. Um, the suggestion of remunerating reviewers in order to provide incentive has been raised, um, but at the National Workshop on Creative Research Output last week, um, it was made very clear that the DHET does not support this idea. There's also the suggestion to appoint three reviewers, not two. UJ has been doing this and it is proving effective. Uh, the suggestion also to cast the nets wider to international peer reviewers. Uh, there is a suggestion to avoid approaching reviewers in industry, particularly those in the design disciplines and rather work with those in academia or working in institutions. Okay, I'm gonna to move to the next point. This is quite easily summarized, this point, and it again has been raised in many forums. There's sector-wide dis dissatisfaction with the delays in outcome for a particular year's submissions and the release of subsidies for these. Um, outcomes and subsidies from output submitted in 2019 and evaluated in uh, February 2020 were, were released in 2021. However, to date, and we're now at the end of 2022, the sector has no information regarding output submitted in 2020 and that were, in value, that were evaluated in 2021. Um, likewise for this year, but that is a little more understandable um, considering that not such a long, time frame has lapsed. But the point is that these delays- I'm sorry, and, you... uh, I know, I'm gonna stop. Okay, <laughs> what I want to say very briefly and, and okay. leave it at that, okay, is that these delays and the lack of information around the de de delays leave applicants feeling very de demotivated and demoralized. We were all very excited, you know, people are excited about this new thing of creative outputs for subsidization, but it, it's wearing thin because it does not seem to yield results or one has to wait so long for the results to, to come through. And so people start thinking um, it's just not worth the time and the effort. I think I can leave it there. Um, we have discussed curatorship. So I won't go into that. And thank yeah, so, that's my um that's thank you, my thank you. Thing. Thank you so much. Uh, the fourth speaker is Dr. Lee Watkins. 
who is the director of the International Library of, of African Music based at Rhodes University. His research interest includes popular music studies, heritage studies, community music, and rural creative economies. He is the editor of the African Music Journal, which was established in 1954. Over to you, Lee. Thank you, Takelali. I'd like to share this um, slide, although it's not much. Um, yes, um, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to present on, on the creative sector. So while I'm a, a kind of a lapsed musician and so on, I'm not I work in the creative sector with musicians and music scholars and so on. So I don't as such do um, work particularly with creative outputs. But what I work with is a, a different, I think, approach or angle to this idea of creative outputs. And that is to write or edit this journal about uh, it's uh, about traditional music or musical performances. African music performances and African derived musical performances in the diaspora, for example. So I deal a lot with creative work, uh, creative um, people, musicians and scholars, combinations of the two. So um, <clears throat> the previous speakers have already mentioned quite a few areas where there are challenges with, um, with reviewing processes, with finding reviewers and with musicians, crossing the, the divide into scholarship, writing about the creative outputs and so on. So I do, so in this, what I'm doing is, is working a lot with musicians who, or scholars who are navigating both worlds. That's our performance and scholarship. So uh, what I do is a lot, I think, well, for me, I would, I would say it's, it's creative editing or in some context regards, it's considered a, a creative or developmental editing. I will come back to why I would perhaps call it creative editing um, for want of a better phrase. Um, so the creativity relates not only to the content of the journal of which I'm the editor, but also in the relations which are cultivated in the course of the production of a journal. So as you said earlier, this, this journal was first established in 1954 by someone called Hugh Tracy. So it's the oldest uh, journal uh, dedicated to, to African music. Um, it's still issued once a year. And so in this, it's, it's an accredited journal, of course, and the content is based on, it used to be entirely traditional music studies and with the earliest uh, scholars of African music writing about traditional music performances in various countries, but also suggesting theories about about these uh, traditions and African music. So that was the first uh, first few decades of this journal. And in recent decades, we've kind of crossed the divide where it's not only traditional music, but also popular music styles like rumba in, in the Congo, for example, which have a strong influence of traditional sounds and musical instruments. And then, of course, the other aspect of this journal is the, the emphasis on field work. So it's the, the knowledge or the data that's obtained in the field is the pri primary data. Um, so, and of course, it's had, the past three years, if, if it's the lockdowns and the arrival of the pandemic, uh, they've had a huge impact on the research, on the quality of research and resulting on in many scholars not being able to conduct the, the traditional field work, as we know today. So the journal has hundreds of downloads per annum. Um, it's, it's given, I think, a platform to many established musicians and scholars. We can have the older generation, the first generation, like A.M. Jones, uh, Kubik, Blacking, and Hugh Tracy, for example. And so um, in recent years, we've, we've also kind of included new, new scholars, young African scholars in particular from other parts of the continent. So my role as the editor of the journal, it's uh, the director of ILAM, this International Library of African Music, is also the director, the editor of, of African Music. Um, so, yeah, so, so for me, it's, it's as the, a difficult transition because uh, 
being the director of the oldest music archive on the continent is already a huge um, responsibility. And then having to edit the journal is also a, a huge responsibility, but the responsibility is informed by a few principles, which I uh, will uh, uh, describe later on. So, and as, as uh, I think many of the, uh, I think one or two of the earlier speakers mentioned there's this question of, of reviewers finding uh, suitable reviewers and in South Africa or on the continent. And so it's, it's very challenging. And even up to today, I still rely extensively on scholars of, of from the U USA, America and Europe, because there are so few African music scholars in the, on the continent. So. So now let's look at the creative aspects, the, 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 the idea of writing about music. So I, I want to assume that all human beings enjoy music. For most of us, music or sound is an integral part of our personal, intimate and social lives. But when writing about music, we need to ignore the intimacy or the passion we have towards a certain music style. We need to detach no matter how personal the choice of music might, might be. These colleagues are among the reasons that makes writing about music a rather difficult exercise. Among music scholars, it is a well-known fact that writing about music is difficult. For after all, how can we translate what we enjoy with our bodies and ears into a text that is written for unknown readers in distant places and for accreditation, um, no less? How do we translate the sensuousness of musical experience into texts which from the outside look dry and unappealing? Now imagine the situation where it is compounded by writing about music in academic English. In the past six years of editing this journal, it has come to my attention that most authors, particularly young black African authors, struggle to make themselves heard in the midst of a multitude of mother tongue languages where the English language is most likely not the mother tongue. And so a lot of the, the young scholars I work with, they, for example, let's say Nigeria or Ghana, speak uh, many other local languages, and then they have to, to write articles in academic English, which um, also has the reputation for being among the most difficult languages in which to write. So you can imagine this, this very alien world which uh, these scholars have to, to navigate. It is striking that there is a phenomenal amount of research taking place on the African continent in African languages and also Europe. Uh, sound is off. Can anybody hear? No, Kian. Um, we're just trying to troubleshoot here and just see if it's on <coughs> our side. But I suspect it actually might be on. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've actually lost connection with, with Dr. Okay. Lewa. Yeah, sorry. I hope he notices it. Yeah, if you're not sitting on his side. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What should we do? What should we do now? Should we wait oh. for you? Um, Professor Marshall, I think maybe just um, we can now go into some dis discussion, maybe, okay. and see when he joins. And if he joins, maybe they also have some load shedding, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think perhaps take some questions. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, any questions for the previous speakers? From Chief Magizela, Renee, 
Leora. Um, if, a... if I may, Prof, uh, okay. I just I just read a comment. It's, it's Chief Mavizela. I just okay, read good, a Chief. comment uh, relating to the uh, this distinction between creative work in general and creative research outputs, um, and that it being a, a slippery, um, uh, I guess you know, a thin line between the two, which Are I you... think I agree with. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hi, hi, Prof. Hi, Jay. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, oh Chief, Chief, you will continue with your question. Let, 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 uh, no problem. Dr. Lee yes. completes his presentation, then we shall come back to the comment. Is that, is that fine? Yeah. Chief? Yeah. Yes, okay. no, no problem, Chair. No problem. Let's go ahead. Thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I need to. You can, uh, yes. Sorry, you can continue. Uh, yeah, I need to apologize because we had an unscheduled uh, load schedule. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. for that, continue. Yeah, I'll, I'll thank you very much for your for your patience. So, um, I'll continue. Uh, so, in the first round, because there are very few, there are a few music journals in South Africa. Um, so, I know in the in the first round of submissions. One or two other journals will reject submissions from these scholars outright. Many of these authors struggle with issues we take for granted. For example, I mentioned how I work with, with young authors in Nigeria or let's say Ghana or Tanzania. And many of them are not, we I think it's South Africa, we take it for granted our facilities and our resources. So many of these young authors don't have access to the latest publications, to the latest research. And so they're inclined to cite work, which is, is kind of old and uh, they've kind of, uh, yeah, so they've been around the block a few times. So the one purpose with the creative aspect also comes in is to expose young scholars to different ways of thinking, of presentation, of writing about music. So that's a, a very, very difficult, area to deal with because you can't expose a young scholar to a large body of work and expect that person overnight to, to have uh, a command of, of that information or this, that literature. So common areas of concern are issues of grammar, uh, when we use British or you know, American English, the colloquial uh, approach, maybe tone of the language, punctuation of which the comma is probably the worst um, the least understood, um, structure, overall presentation, and conceptualization of the research question or argument. This concern is not only with articles submitted to the journal, I also experience it in other submissions of when the universities approach me to examine um, thesis, for example. Inevitably, unfortunately, many of these, these um, scholars will, 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 they don't do well in the, in the examination process. So do we keep on rejecting articles without a second thought? What would be the implications for the author and the journal? This, I think, requires an intervention of sorts, or what is referred to as developmental editing. So to this end, an active attention to the hard groundwork involved in the decolonization of editing has to be pursued. Instead of outright rejection, inexperienced authors are mentored and coached according to the generally accepted standard conventions of publishing. And then I mentioned the word standards and I ask whose? What is the logic applied to these standards? And so my role as editor, it, it's, I'm the gatekeeper, but I'm also, I'm also the tyrant. I have to uphold this body of this, collect this, um, this collection of the standards and these rules and regulations for the article or the publication to be accredited and, um, and receive wider uh, acceptance and so on. So once a suitable standard for reviewing purposes is reached, the article is sent out for peer review to reviewers who understand the politics of the editorial process from a developmental perspective. Unfortunately, most of the reviewers are based in the US, UK, and other European countries. So my experience as is, is quite, um, there's a lot that I need to, need to uphold. 
which these include the principles of blind peer reviewing, uh, read the reviews, select the parts we agree with reviewers, forward these to the authors and request an online meeting to discuss the reviews with them. Sometimes these reviews can be overwhelming, even when I ask the editor to read them, but it can be quite a lot to wade through, uh, especially for, and especially for early career authors or scholars. It is a process of continual back and forth and frustrated more by questions of young authors in most African countries not having access to new publications. They are therefore inclined to cite local unaccredited publications or publications which are old. So come the end of the year, a new edition of the journal appears. The complete, the new edition does not signify the amount of labor that I'm, goes I'm, into I'm, the production. I'm giving you two minutes, which are in your, in your time. Yes, thanks. So, okay, so, so the glossy cover suggests a smooth process of engagement between authors, editors, and reviewers, but this is most not the case. So what about relations with authors, reviewers, and scholars? How may this space be imagined as one for creative or developmental editing? And as for the creative perspective, the word creative suggests something that is immediate, expressive, and possibly a great deal of fun. But it is this always the case. How can one fulfill one's role as editor so that young authors are not alienated from the process of producing a, an accredited publishing published article? In the above, I have more questions and answers. Of particular concern is my role as the editor. I'm also an ethnomusicologist. If I have no other disciplines, then the quality of my work might be left wanting. Similarly, if I were not to engage with the author, to mentor that person, then the journal might also be left wanting. And I have to question my style, role as the editor within a trajectory of developmental editing. Um, so with those are my concluding words. I think it's it resonates very well with the preceding papers. And thank you for your attention. And once again, my apologies for the break in the transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, for your presentation. I will give this opportunity to Chief Mavisela to comment on Thomas' comment, which was on the chat. Chief? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Just to try and complete that uh, thought uh, quickly, um, the, what the policy does is it assumes that institutions are conducting research and that uh, whether that is on the uh, one side, uh, the output being the publication of that research, or on the other side of the artistic uh, artifacts. Um, so that is the assumption. But then, of course, uh, there is money involved, and I've explained this one already in terms of what the money is for, and, and simply uh, it's for subsidy. But then the, the, the point I wanted to make on, in this uh, uh, slopey uh, or slippery demarcation between um, uh, research output and the, the creative creativity or you know, in artistic outputs, the, the policy is not intended to change the behavior of uh, the academics. Um, that behavior being uh, that, that of production of research. But uh, because there is money involved and uh, be it uh, the money to the institution or the, whichever way the institution uses it, then the policy is going to become a dictator of that change uh, of behavior. And this is, this is the reason why we also want to, be, to have the sector discussing is um, the, the the differences between the two, and uh, so that so that we are clear at the end what what should we do with the policy, and what should uh, how should we improve it, uh, especially in this area, or do we just um, get to a point where we say uh, we agree to disagree? You know, I think that's how that's how I wanted to to respond to that. Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chief. Any other comment from the floor? Anna, go for it. 
And good afternoon, everyone. I'm just thinking about um, what was said, and obviously, uh, having creative outputs is it's a fantastic um, uh, way forward. Um, but when we are discussing uh, publishing, I have an impression that we are still talking about publishing in terms of publishing research about um, creative outputs or something like that. Technology gives us opportunities to probably look further than that. And I'm just thinking, how can we as journals, especially journals in the fields of humanities, actually promote their, um, those creative outputs and how we can overcome the practicalities of this in terms of, um, well, anything, you know, in terms of um, copyright, in terms of uh, access, in terms of providing links to this work. Um, and are there any examples of such um, incorporation of actually um, the artistic outputs into publications of journals, specifically in terms of online publishing? Thank you very much. Any other input question before the panelists respond? Okay, Renee Liora, Chief Lee, that is a question for you. One of you can go on and respond. Sorry, um, can you just uh, repeat that question about the... the... Sorry. The, the question was on incorporation of human publications and also how to incorporate them into artist work. I'm thinking I've captured it correctly, yeah. Anna. Yes, into the yeah. journals, actually, how to link the journals with those creative outputs. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think one one option would be to have a section in the journal reserved for these kinds of outputs. The second thing is, um, is well, in my field, I've, I think it's very important, especially with young authors um, or, or musicians who are working or occupying both, with their feet in both the, the, the research and the performance or the other kinds of creative outputs. It's very important for us as editors to to guide uh, musicians or, or artists in how to, to manage this, this, this world of, um, of academic writing. So I think that's, and that's what makes our, our work, um, it's really kind of prescriptive, but it also makes it, especially uh, in Southern South Africa and on this continent, it's very important for especially young scholars to have to have this kind of, kind of support from uh, more senior scholars. Um, yeah, so it, it, it complicates and makes, one work, makes one's work a lot more. Um, the volume is, is quite, quite heavy, but um, I think it's one of our, of, our, of our functions as editors. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Igli? Hi. Um, I'm Eagle Gledhill. I'm a physicist from industry now in academia. And um, I do need to comment that having returned to academia after over 30 years, I'm astonished at the change in behavior that has been driven by, and I'm going to call them incentive schemes, because at my level, that's what they are. They are schemes for incentives. I understand global competitiveness, I understand the ranking of universities and so on, but does this drive really innovative, really original thought? I think the answer is probably no, especially given the pressures that we work under today. So um, I am in favor of a different kind of evaluation of individuals and institutions in which targets are set and then there's a review of whether they are met or not, and that research should be funded as research. So I'd like to put that into the, the discussion, whether it is for sciences, engineering, computer sciences, um, arts, or humanities. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ailey. Uh, any response? I think this will go through the policy. Professor Shaw, I see that Leora has her hand raised. Oh, okay, okay, Leora. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can respond to it, yeah, I hope I have understood the question correctly. Um, but in the visual arts, there is um, a new, well, it's not that new, a way of dealing with practice-led approaches to writing. Now, this is, it's kind of, you know, we've, we've uh, no, I don't think anyone has really reached consensus as to what a practice-led or practice-based approach to making is. And this is like another step forward um, that how does an artist then write about their work in a way that is reflective of the practice? And uh, there are a couple of journals um, that, that do specialize in this. Um, the Journal of Artistic Research is one, and that is on the DOE accredited lists. And there is one that uh, is run through Wits University called Ellipses, where, and it's a very, it's, it's a very fine line, where the artwork is presented, but also written about by the artist. And this might be, um, yes, uh, thank you, Renee. Leonardo Ellipses, yeah, uh, that, that's true. Um, this is something we might need to start considering um, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonardo. Chief? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh... The, the first question on technology was quite complex and and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to deal with it. Uh, safe to say, Chair, that we that there's still some outstanding analysis we wanted to do looking at the publications outputs in the field in the, the publications that deal with the um, uh, with the arts. Um, an example has been given, for instance, of one journal that is a DHET um, list accredited. Um, but we wanted to look at this comprehensively, all the indexes that are approved by the DHET. And um, uh, I'm looking for the right way to yeah, sort of overlay that analysis with the creative outputs um, uh, analysis. Uh, the, the analysis that we do on the creative outputs and see how this, um, how, how, the, how do they reflect when they are juxtaposed, but also at some point in future to also see if there is influence of one on the other. Um, influence could be, you know, the decrease in publications, the increase in, in, in uh, the artifacts, or, or either way, or just the increase on both uh, on both sides, you know, whatever whatever the, the data tells us. So we, we haven't looked at that. We have seen though that uh, the growth that we have been seeing in the publications continues. Um, uh, continues, I mean, also during this period that we have started to implement the creative outputs because it comes later than that of uh, the policy on, on publications. So the, that one is still up in the air. Um, but as I said, you know, I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer the, the question in its complexity and on how then we, you know, the, the system or the sector can use technology to, to drive um, the, the outputs. Uh, or, or, or they are, or they are um, uh, publication uh, or marketing, I suppose. Then the, the, the second question, which I like actually the suggestion, um, but I am sure the, uh, the view that, that was put by um, Eagle is not necessarily that, uh, that it's, it's a simple, uh, process. 
I think in my experience on the implementation of these policies, there are pros and cons, and, and sometimes the cons do appear to overwhelm the, the pros, especially when the unethical acti uh, 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 yeah, activities uh, come up. And, 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 you know, sort of uh, overshadow what is good about the policy. Um, the, and the idea, of course, uh, definitely not from the policy perspective, was never, at national level at least, was never to incentivize, absolutely not. And that's why I'm saying, I was saying earlier on, the, the incentives now that are implemented at institutional level, institutional policy, it's difficult to see whether, in fact, I, I don't think I'm wrong by saying that they have become inducements and no longer incentives. And, and, and there's, um, it's difficult to even see what, ha what is remaining as an incentive uh, within the institutions. So should we then throw the baby with the bathwater, terrible as that sounds, but that's the phrase, um, in favor of a complete change of, uh, of, uh, of the policy? Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying this, Chair. And this is my final point. I'm not saying this in defense of the current uh, system. I'm just saying it um, because I think I see some value in it, and that uh, the sector uh, does benefit as the sector now, the university sector, in terms of a, a identifiable research funding that comes from the state. I would hate to see one day when that funding disappears completely. Um, thanks, Chair. Th thank you very much for the response, Chief, uh, and I hope maybe when you revise the policy, you will look at what has been discussed here. I think I uh, have come to an end of the session where I will hand over again to Susan and Kiel. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, another very interesting um, project, and I think some of the questions that came up, particularly from Eagle, uh, have been on the agenda for many years now, over a decade. Uh, we still are grappling with um, what is research when an object is created. Is the object itself the research output, or is the self-reflexive analysis that would be published in a peer-reviewed journal about how the object was created in relation to a reception of it by uh, an audience or um, viewers. Is that the research or is the whole process research? I don't know. Uh, anyway, thanks very much for these discussions. I think that it's getting quite late. Um, we've all been at it for quite long and I'm noticing um, a drop off in um, delegate attendance. Uh, so people have got other things that they want to do. So let me therefore, hand over to Susan and ask her if there's any housekeeping or other um, advice she wants to give us for uh, the continuation of the conference tomorrow morning. Um, thank you, Kian. I don't think there's anything from my side, except again to thank um, everybody um, attending today's um, conference. Um, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, I think this is um, really, um, discussions on the extremely high level and, and I think everything will contribute um, especially today to in revising the policy eventually and I can see um, there's this sort of a slow um, emergence between um, the research output policy and the creative output policy I can see um, somewhere in, in, in the far future um, definitely um, <laughs> that that one will have to rethink about the definition of research output and a creative output, um, definitely, most certainly. Um, so colleagues, I invite you back then tomorrow morning and we will start, let me just make 100% sure, nine o'clock sharp tomorrow morning and looking forward to meet you again via this platform. Um, thank you, Kian, and thank you once again to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending. <clears throat> Popularize the discussions to your colleagues. All right.